All right. Guys, my mic was off, so glad I noticed that. So the last time we left, we were on chapter four, and we were working on uh, this application. I'm feeling kind of sick today, so uh, I apologize if I sound horrendous. But uh, you know, what can you do? Go on winter break and you get sick. That's just kind of how it works. So we have this application here that we've been working on for four chapters now. Basically, you can do a few things. You can switch the the size of these little icons. That's basically it. You can select them, and when you select them, they kind of get shown in this bigger window over here. Uh, you can get a random image by just clicking this Surprise Me button. And there's some extra little um, information displayed as a mouse over. So you can see, like, this is Epica Live at the Agora, Speech Side, City Museum, Untitled, Boat in Glass. So that's literally all it does right now. Um, but this chapter, what we're going to implement is actually um, some filters on top of this these images so we're gonna have like a little thing up here i guess that allows us to apply some some changes to the image and those changes are going to happen in javascript so the idea is that uh the sliders we're gonna have like three sliders up here here let me show you like a so it's gonna be like this there's gonna be three sliders like so and we're going to use in Elm, we're going to adjust these and then I guess make a call out to JavaScript to uh, render like a, uh, you know, a rippled version and a change of hue and stuff like that. So that's what we're going to do. Um, okay. And the way we do that is basically uh, these custom elements. So. Just for reference, the only thing that's changed since we we worked on this last is I'm going to try out this Elm Live server that somebody suggested. So I, I wrote a little script that kind of does something very similar, um, but this one will watch all of the Elm files in in the directory and monitor any changes. We currently only have one um, Elm file, but if we had more, it would be a lot easier to deal with if we use this Elm Live thing instead of what I was doing before, which is basically just using the Linux file system to search for changes on uh, this particular file. So it, it's using some other tool. I think it's called Chokadar. Um, Chokadar, I have no idea. Um, and it just builds all this stuff and uh, serves it for us. So we're going to try it. I, I don't know if it's going to really increase our the productivity of our workflow at all, but we'll try it out. So. That's running in another terminal, and then I just have my terminal where we work. So right now we have basically a few things. Um, for reference, I'm just kind of going through all this. Um, yeah, I, and I'm not using the on notify wait script anymore. Uh, we, I mean, again, this is basically doing the exact same thing. Um, it's just that, you know, it, it is doing the same thing. It's probably unnecessary. Yeah, I don't know. So anyway, we got some type alias for a photo that just represents a, a record containing three uh, fields, URL, size, and title. And essentially, we have some uh, decoder that allows us to read a, gosh, I forget how this works. Hang on. OK, so. We're, we we make this git command or a git request for to this URL, which just gives us back a few photos. Essentially, we can just open this up real quick. It's just like this. So all we're doing is decoding these records. That's exact. That's all we're doing. The wrong thing. And then we know where those photos are, so we just uh, display them at some point. So that's our URL, and then we expect some JSON that we can decode for these photos, right? So I showed you this before, but um, that's basically what we're decoding, a URL, a size, and a title. So there are some cases where title is null, so we just deal with those by setting it to um, untitled. That's the idea. 
So it can deal with the nulls, which is nice. Um, we have basically a model that keeps track of two things. I forget what this status is exactly. Oh, here's our status. So yeah, we haven't really done anything with this because we don't really have a way to model errors. So there's really only two states. There's a loading state at the beginning where um, I don't think anything happens. It's just when the photos aren't being showed. And then after we make that get request and uh, we process all of the JSON and we then display all the images, that's the idea. So you can see here, this is our initial model. So, oh, and the, just for reference, this chosen size is uh, this piece right here. So it starts at medium and we can pick large, small, medium, etc. Uh, if you have any questions about what's going on, I'm sort of just refreshing myself of uh, how this code exactly looks because uh, it has been a week and a half. So um, it's been a little bit of time. No water today either. We're drinking tea. Otherwise, my throat's gonna, or my uh, voice is going to go to crap. So um, we're going to try tea today. Um, this here just allows us to um, put the radio button. So it basically takes a selected size and what is this size for? Why do we take two thumbnail sizes? Oh, so this one of these sizes is a selected size and one of these is the new size. So this is like um, if you pick medium, what is your current size? This allows us to render uh, basically this dot. So what we need to do is know if medium is selected and which one of these buttons we're talking about. So if we're talking, if we're selected as medium, but we're on small, we wanna make sure that this is not checked, but we need to make sure that this one's checked. That's basically what that's doing. Um, this just allows us to render the names on the page. So it's like, uh, if we have a size called small, we can render it to a string that is physically small. Uh, the thumbnail is literally where we go get the images from. So we build that URL that I was telling you before, like we parse the JSON to get the names of the images, and then we just pass the URL um, to almanaction.com slash whatever, and it will go get that. It'll write that title, that's that mouse over title. Um, and if it's selected, we, what's this do? I think we looked this up before. I think this is a function that, Basically, um, hang on. It takes a list of strings and bools and returns attributes. So, like, you can see that we can, if this is true, it will display selected. Um, if this is false, it will not display selected. And that's how we deal with, um, this circular or this uh surrounding thing so all of these images won't be selected because that will be false so that will be a list of six items five of which will be false and one of which will be true which displays this actual um thing around here and then we have our, our view function which is basically just um if we're loaded if we've actually found some uh your uh if we've actually found some images, we'll view it. Uh, this right now can't be triggered, but potentially you could point this to a server that it wouldn't work. So you would just get a, a big fat error message, I guess. And then we have this view loaded function, which just goes and gets the, the URLs that we need. That's, that's all it's doing. Um, we have our click, I'm gonna sneeze here in a second. So I'll, I'll mute for that if I, if I can get there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, right, right. So there's two types of images. There's the small images and the large images. So um, these are the small images that are you can change the size of. Um, and this one is the large image. So it, it just matches up the two. That's what this large is for. All right. We have some messages that which basically let uh, our our application work so there's like a click photo so when i click a photo it keeps a track of what photo i clicked and then goes and renders it for click surprise we just go choose a random photo choose size is when we change the size of the photos 
and uh it turns out we need to do an extra round trip to uh to deal with a click photo event so or i'm sorry a uh a click surprise event so a click surprise event essentially triggers a get random photo event or message i shouldn't call them events and that way we can deal with the photo specifically why is click photo a string actually why is click photo a string we'll have to look at that in a second i'm not sure why that is okay um so yeah selected url is basically like if you have a loaded photo you can just show the photo um we have some this is our actual update so again this is like a um uh, up a view update model view update i guess that's what the architecture is called very similar to react if you've done javascript um but this deals with with this so you can see here is where we deal with this get random photo thing. Um, so when you click surprise, if you have a loaded file, this is what does the got random photo. So this is what actually selects a random photo and then returns a message. And then that message gets sent back down to here. And then we re-render our model with the new, um, photo basically then we have some other bits here got random photo got photos blah 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 okay and then finally our browser element which actually does the the bits of work that we need so we we point it to an init a view an update and then these subscriptions so we haven't really done much with init basically our initial um command is an initial model and initial command if i remember correctly initial command just does the uh yeah it actually goes and gets the the photos so that's what it's doing um as as its initial event so we want to create an event to get things rolling uh with our http requests so that's what the init function does this thing here we're currently ignoring but we could pass configuration to the the application through this you know what would be a named parameter at some point i don't actually know how to do that yet uh, i assume that's going to be talked about at some point and uh subscriptions i don't remember exactly what these are for um so i don't want to talk about them now but i assume at some point we're going to learn more about subscriptions there was mention of what subscriptions were i just don't remember what they are at this current point in time so anyway that's our application it's about 200 well no it's a 200 lines of code including white space which there's a lot of white space in elm applications so this is probably not that many lines of code um we could probably inverse grep for non-white space lines but i don't i don't care that much okay so let's get to um implementing our thing i shouldn't do that i gotta get back to being a good a good vim user um what do we need to do we need index html and we're going to write in a custom element into um uh, we're going to add a custom element here right so it always puts in the this kind of stuff and what i want to do is move this over and move that over and we'll move this over okay okay so we have class i've never written javascript in my life so uh don't don't expect me to understand what's going on here um but what i do understand is that you can have custom elements and the custom elements must have a dash in their name and apparently they correspond to this range slider that's now here uh this range slider is an html element with a connected callback whatever that means um and it figures out what 
it creates an input element and appends it. So I guess this means that we would just have some kind of input element when we render this to the page. Although I don't think anything's gonna happen if we just do this. I don't think we'll actually get a any change in the application. Ugh. I'm trying not to be as sniffly as I am, so I'm really sorry if that's obnoxious, but there's not much I can do about it. It's worse that I'm talking, so. So did that actually render? Yeah, it looks like it. I didn't actually change it, but it were it did, you know, it did something. But we don't see we don't see any physical change here. You know, I was expecting something. So anyway, we'll we'll I'm sure we'll get back to to that. Why is this not on the page anymore? Weird. Okay. Let me go back to the code. So here we're using the class keyword that was added to JavaScript in ECMA. I think people say ECMA, ECMAScript 2015. I'm not actually sure if that's true. Maybe I just made that up. It says, all you need to know about it is that connected callback declares a new method on the class and we'll be working inside that method declaration to wire up our range slider. Uh, certain older browsers don't support class or for that matter custom elements fortunately the custom elements polyfill I don't even know what that means offers a solution if you need support support the browsers in question okay fine this registers the range slider, so that allows us to use the like a, a tag called range dash, dash slider. That's what this does right here. It says, from now on, whenever a DOM element with the tag name range slider appears on this page, it will behave according to the implementation we've imported here. Okay, interesting. Oh, so before I forget, I gotta thank a bunch of people for following. Um, so Clavin X, Profit2906, Chevsky, Chevsky, uh, Emmy Flake, and Maricino. Uh, five followers randomly while I wasn't streaming, I think. So that's pretty awesome. So thank you very much. We're at 171, which is amazing. Okay. And I think they do point out that there has to be a dash in here. I don't know what that's, what the dash, like why it needs to be there, but apparently it needs to be there. Okay. So back at the beginning of chapter two, we saw the HTML.node function it takes a tag name, a list of attributes, and a list of children. Do -do -do. Okay. All right, so we can add a range slider. So that, yeah, okay, so as expected, this didn't do anything. We need to actually like wire it up into our act, uh, application. So we do that by going to our HTML, which is probably in our view. It wouldn't be in our view loaded. We, where would we put this? <laughs> Here, maybe? Not entirely sure where we're going to put this yet, but um, let's let's put it here, I suppose. So we're going to make a list here, um, but instead of this, it's going to have to be plus plus this, and we'll probably have to add some parentheses around this whole jam. And then in here, we could write something like, I believe, uh, Node 
range, slider. All right, what is this complaining about? Oh, right. So we have a single element here, so we can use the concatenation operator. And I suppose that this is correct. And if we do this, this should compile, and then we should see an input box up here, which we do. We didn't see that before. So uh, there's our input box. It's probably not where we want it, but I just wanted to see if I could make it happen. Oops. Um, and then because this looks really funny, let's do the following. Can we format this? That's not the right one. Yeah, there we go. Okay, it'll format for us. So that's what it's decided. Sometimes I forget that it will do the formatting for us, but it does. So that's all you would need to do to write this. So one thing that they're doing here is is adding a function to do this. Uh, I have no idea where we should put it. Let's just put it here for now. Um, we could write range slider attributes children okay and then we can say range slider is a list of attribute message we don't know what kind of message it is oh right right we're now in elm world it's gonna then take a list of html message and it's gonna return an html okay why is this complaining whoops unused top oh right we haven't used it yet right 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 now another cool thing about um elm is that these are completely unnecessary we don't need them we could write this and it will compile uh we'll we'll figure out how to use this in a second so these are just partially applied functions so we're partially applying this to these two things to get back an HTML message. I don't think we're going to do anything with the attributes and children. Maybe we will, so we might need those later. I'm not sure, but that's all you need to do if you wanted. Okay, so viewing the sliders. Next, let's invoke range slider to render the slides. Sure, you got it. So now we're going to write a view filter function is going to take a string int and return an HTML message apparently. So view filter name magnitude of class filter slider label oh uh, one thing that it pointed out is that label is essentially this with instead of range slider in here it's just label so it's they're always nodes these are always nodes they just have this first uh, entry as the name of the html dom element so that was the point of them showing this basically if that wasn't clear Same thing with text. Label text name, range slider, which 
Actually, let's put that there. I assume that there's some sort of slider things that we'll deal with here in a little bit. Attributes. Property. Val. Jason. And code int. Magnitude. Why do I need this JSON encode? I don't I don't know yet. Label from int magnitude. Okay. Oh, I need some more stuff. That's gotta close that. Okay, so, right, there's no actions here. What did I write? Do I not have JSON encode? I only have decode, I guess. Okay. So we also need to encode stuff, so... Let's add that. And then... Okay, uh, but let's let's get only int for encode for now. And then we probably want HTML attributes max. Or does it matter? I don't I don't know what this is. I mean we can look at both of them real quick. Well, it only takes one thing, so it's clearly not this. It's clearly this. So HTML attributes max. I don't know why I keep doing that. Okay, hang on, I gotta sneeze. Oh my goodness. Attributes X. Okay. Now we're just getting um, not used, so that's good. Okay, and then let's format this and we'll just look at it real quick again. Uh, I assume there's some sort of Filter slider. I, don't, I mean, this is just some random class name, right? I don't know if there's any information about this. Uh, we have some label that just has some text in it. Um, we might see some stuff in here if we look at it. Well, yeah, but we're not actually viewing, we're not using view filter yet. That's right. We're just looking at the, um, we just have this written in here like this, so this isn't actually doing anything. Uh, let's get rid of that again. I think it's this one. Get rid of that. Save. Okay, now it's fine. Um, format real quick. There we go. Okay. So let's go look at that code again. So it says, here we're using JSON encode int. Not to encode JSON, 
as the name might suggest, but rather to encode a JavaScript value for the HTML attribute property function. This will set a JavaScript property on this range slider node so that our custom element can read it later. This property will be named val and will be set to our magnitude value. Oh, this is keeping track of some something. The JSON encode int function specifies what the property's type will be on the JavaScript side. If we had used JSON encode string, uh, the property would have been set to a JavaScript string instead of a number. We'll look at this later. I, can we see this in the, uh, the HTML? I guess we'll find out. Oh, okay. So there's a section called ambiguous name. So it says the compiler will complain and we will, you know, we, we clearly need We clearly need to write HTML attributes max because the, the types of max are different. So if we, we use our Elm search, which by the way, you can get uh, here, put it in the chat. If you, if you know what Google is, this is the Elm version of Google. What's up, Aman? How are you doing? I feel like I haven't seen you in a while, but maybe you've been sort of lurking and not talking, <clears throat> which is obviously fine. This isn't pure script, this is Elm, um, but the book we're working on is called Elm in Action. So if we do Elm in Action, you can, you can see where the book is and where the code is that I'm working on. So we're learning Elm because I wanna build a website. I was not doing pure script in the past. I have not done pure script. We, we tried to do um, Yesed at one point, um, for web stuff, but it was just too hard. Oh, that's okay. No worries. This is just, uh, yeah. So we, we, we're starting with Elm. We may switch to peer script at some point. I got some, um, there were some people on Twitter who, who suggested peer script, but, um, they're saying like Elm probably makes sense for what you're trying to do. And if you, you know, if you, if things get, more intense, you might find that peer script will help you. Um, so we may have to learn peer script at some point, but we're, we're going to create a pretty simple website. So I think that Elm will probably be fine. And also I feel like I get it, which is really nice. Like I, um, I feel like I'm making progress with how this whole thing is set up and works. Uh, I need to go get a glass of water again because I'm having a hard time. Uh, I'm, I need to, I'm having a hard time swallowing and stuff, so I'm not feeling particularly well today. So just bear with me for a second while I go grab a, a glass of water. Thanks everyone. Okay. Here we go. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what I came down with, but last night I started feeling like, like crap and it's just, you know, it, it always devolves into a worse sickness. Mm hmm. Apparently the flu season's pretty bad. Oh, that's much better. Um, okay, so you said, uh, I want to do a pretty complex UI, but I can't decide what to use. I am not the guy to answer that question for sure. Um, Jappy, uh, Jappy Jappy, who's also on Twitch, um, he's done quite a bit uh, more UI stuff than me. 
but everyone that I've talked to is like, look, Elm is simple, so that's probably what you should start with until you feel comfortable with front end stuff. And again, that's coming from somebody who already knows Haskell pretty well, right? That's the, the point. If I didn't know Haskell at all, then it might be a different story. Okay, I'm gonna sneeze again, one second. Okay, maybe not. This is bad. Anyway, um, it is very restricting, that's true. I mean, maybe per script will make more sense for you. Um, I, I, if you have more front end experience, then Pure script would probably be fine for you. I I, I have no idea. Um, you might want to ask on Twitter if people can give you a compare and contrast. I, I I unfortunately can't. I can't tell you. I don't know. Okay. So what I was trying to explain is if you just look at the types, this is basic dot max, and it takes two things that are comparable and returns something that's comparable. Just not what we have. What we're trying to do is take a string and convert it to an attribute of message. So we need this max, which comes from um, HTML. That's all I was trying to explain. And we just used our quick little Google to figure out which one we need. And I didn't really have to, oh, it's down here. HTML attributes versus basics. I didn't even have to really think about it very much. I just let the types guide me, which is something I really like to do. Okay. So now we need to actually render some sliders oh oh we can actually do some some stuff here so we did this but we can also do something like this and i haven't seen this before i don't think in code so instead of like um just exposing everything the way we were doing it before you can do something like this to try and make the, your life a little bit easier so um this way you can just write like enc dot int or whatever and it's a little a little less problematic so if we go look for uh json oh it's right there oh no we need encode dot encode we can change this to just encode int and it will just work and the other thing that they suggest doing is taking html uh, attributes and calling this as adders and then that way you can just start working through um you can just start working through this and figure out how to how to fix this Although it looks like this is going to be problematic because now with string, we have to deal with that. So we could probably call this as decode and then put decode. So we're just going to work through some compiler errors and try and clean up our, our module imports a little bit. So there's that. Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's pretty clear that that's the right way to do it. Yeah, and this like exposing dot dot kind of gets you through, gets you some flexibility when you're trying to write at least. So it might make sense to even just remove the as exposing stuff and just fix the compiler errors now. Could you give me an example? I feel like there's, I mean, we have polymorphism, right? Maybe I, I'm misunderstanding what, like where you're, you mean. I don't know, it's hard to say. Um, okay, so now I gotta fix that one. So decode uh, dot list. So this just becomes decode. Um, property becomes adder. Yeah. So this just becomes, oops, let me just do this.
That should fix that. And then we're good. Yeah, I, I uh, the ambiguous functions thing doesn't bother me very much. It's just getting getting used to like uh, adding the the full definition right where you want it. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't bother me that much. Like the compiler tells me what to do more or less. So I, I kind of like that at least. But I could see how that would get annoying after a while. I don't know. I kind of want to remove all of these dot dots right now, but. Um... It's not polymorphic in its name. Right. That's what you mean, because. Oh, I guess you're right. Although I, I feel like it's not polymorphic. It's not, that's not the right term though, right? It's not, because um, we're talking about functions with different numbers of arguments, right? I think is what you're saying. If you, when you refactor from two props to three again, So, so if you write this, if you write this, so this whole thing here, it's going to expose everything from attributes as well as give you the qualified. So, um, <laughs> mistype classes, fair enough. Um, so everything in here is still dot dot so I can still use attributes as necessary but if I have name collisions I now only have to write attdrs dot the name so I think even oh yeah so if I get rid of gosh I keep I should just go back to, if I get rid of this right I'll get a name collision and Instead of having to write this long thing, I can just write adders instead. I keep doing this too. Um, a T T R S dot. And for, I think for property, did I have the same issue with property? I don't think I did. So like you can have both of these. So you have adders max, and then this one doesn't need to be specified um, exactly like that. So it just saves you a little bit of typing. For something like HTML attributes, um, you know, we're using a lot of stuff from attributes. We're using a lot of stuff from HTML. So, you know, maybe we call this as events. Uh, you know, this is just as pipeline because we're only using a few functions. Um, but maybe we don't need this exposing here uh, because we're really only using one function. We're not, we don't need a lot of them. Um, random's probably the same thing. I probably should just use the qualified names. So, I think I'm I'm a little sloppy right now in the import statements, but I think there's probably a better way to do it. But we'll keep it like this for now. I do like getting rid of the dot dot here. And honestly, we're not using that much from decode either. And almost all of them are qualified, but we do lose the, the decoder part, right? Although I suppose we could do this and then say decoder, and we should still compile. Almost. Decode.succeed. Yeah, so like that's the only place we're really using it so we can get rid of some dot dots. Anyway, I could probably spend some time, you know, cleaning this stuff up and it would probably be a lot better than it is. Like we can't possibly be using that much stuff from random. So, um, you know, like this kind of stuff would probably be a lot cleaner if I didn't do it. But anyway, we're we'll we'll deal with this stuff at some point. Need out courses. 
Uh, I don't understand the first part of questions. Oh, we, I get it. Okay. Uh, yes, I do. Do I believe in them as in I would teach them or, or they should exist? I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, but they definitely do exist in some fields. So I can tell you for a fact that for chemistry, it was um, physical chemistry that usually gets some slackers, I guess if you will. Okay, so we're going to go back to view loaded. Um, and we're going to deal with our filters here, apparently. So underneath our buttons, we're going to add another div. Div. Class. Uh, nearly all of my classes were curved in school. It's pretty common for that, though. So we're going to have view filter view zero. View filter. I honestly couldn't even tell you. It was so long ago. Um, ripple. It was so long ago that I I don't pot, I I couldn't tell you if what ones were not or what ones were for my classes. It was a long time ago. A long time ago. All right, and then this is called filter. Um, no, no, e even if they're curved, you can still lose people, um, right? Like you just have to be below a D on the curve, right? Outliers still would fail. Okay. Um, they would get closer to not failing, but they would probably still fail. Unless there was not enough samples, right? But then you couldn't curve anyway. As in like three students. Uh, okay, so now in theory we should get, assuming this compiles, which it does, we should get um, some stuff here that are just inputs. These don't do anything yet. Um, because we, we don't have them set up. They're just input boxes. Um, but you know, I assume what we're going to do is mess with this, the input box in, um, the JavaScript side to turn these into sliders and then handle their values on the, on the Elm side. I'm not exactly sure what we're going to do. So we'll just keep reading, but there's our, why is there no zero next to them? So they show a zero next to them. Why do I not have that? That should be the label, but I'm not getting that. Why not? Do we have the range slider max with its property? And then we should have a label next to it that takes the magnitude and displays it as a string. Why is this label not there? Is it just not the right color? Not there. Is it down here somewhere? What's going on? We see the text name. We have the range slider with basically nothing in it, right? Yep, and then text from int magnitude. Why 
Why is it not there? They don't understand. So it's behind the slider? What if I delete it? There's the zero. Okay, so something something's up with the CSS basically. The zero is underneath the the input label. I don't know how to fix that like immediately, but it's still there. I assume this will get fixed when these are actually sliders and not input boxes. Not entirely sure. Can you like undo it? Oh, interesting. Why, why is there two of them though? So anyway, the numbers are under here. I don't, I don't exactly know why, but they're there. They're just not in the right spot. Maybe I feel like I'm missing something. This does nothing. Okay, I'm thinking about this too much. It's not worth my time. Okay, so it says, notice that although we rendered three range slider elements to the DOM, the browser displays an input for each of them. Uh, we know why. So we need to replace the input with our custom slider and we do that by adding some element action code. So we're going to go grab that and fix that. Uh, so we'll save this. And down here, what did I just do? And next to our style sheet up here, we'll put the, these links. So this is going to get our CSS for our range slider and then the JavaScript for the range slider. And I presume that we can just remove this script or no? Um, I mean, we can just look this up, right? All we got to do is copy. Oh, geez. That's unreadable. Uh, but the question is, does it contain class? Class range. Okay, it does not. It's just the this the scripts to deal with that stuff okay so all we need to do is create this append child input bar jsr equals new jsr input you put semicolons after stuff I think you do. What is what eyesore? The the JavaScript? Cause yeah, it hurts my eyes as well. I was just looking to see it. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, then I need another one of these, right? No, I don't. I'm stupid. Sorry. Bear with me. Don't know what I'm doing.
max this dot max values this dot val so this is really only useful when uh like i'm trying to incorporate for me uh, when i'm trying to or or incorporate code that already exist already exists in the javascript world into my code uh i i don't know how to write uh javascript so like i probably will not write much of this okay so this is like we create an input object add it like i don't know what this means and then we turn it into a JSR object? What, why do I need to assign it? Like, is this necessary? Oh. Hey. Thank you. Yeah. It's the Foxtrot stuff? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We got T, folks. It's exciting. Oh, yeah, that's good. So this tea is like a mix of mint and chamomile, basically. It's a really good tea. A little expensive. For be oh, it's got other stuff in it, I suppose, but anyway. <sighs> so apparently we've now sent a value. So this value comes from uh, our Elm code and gets sent into into here. So I'll show you. Right, so this is that property. So we're taking uh, our magnitude and we're sending it off or setting it as the, um, a property on our range slider, which we're getting from JavaScript, so. Yeah, I don't know what the JSR does at all. Yeah, it, it's going to make a slider of some sort. Actually, that's not true. It's not doing a slider. It's doing some sort of image manipulation is my guess. Wait, no, it can't do Im image manipulation. It just, it just does the slider, I think. I'll be honest, I don't like the way this looks already, but there's not much I can do about it. So now we have our slider. I don't like that. So here's what I don't like. You see how this goes just to the end, but starts at the beginning. I don't, I don't like that. It should be like, my opinion is it should be all the way right. And then this shouldn't have like some space here, but you know, but I'm not a designer. So anyway, now we have our slider. So my guess is the JSR thing is, is doing the slider part, but anyway, we can now see our numbers. It has access to every. You don't know what. You don't know what the JSR. Oh, okay. I see your point. So, um, like, I that that JavaScript that piece of JavaScript that I just added could do whatever it wanted. That's your point, right? It doesn't need to be. Um, I'm not. Well, maybe that's not your point. I'm not entirely sure. Um, and actually does, is that actually true because we're wrapping it inside of something or no? Like, I don't even, I, I truthfully don't know. Uh, I, I want to look at this. So if we put this so inside of this thing, does it still have access to everything or only the properties of itself? I don't know anything about this HTML element, does it separate itself from the rest of the DOM or no? Access to everything? Okay. 
even wrapping it in this doesn't really matter. So this is really just for show, is what you're saying. By wrapping this, we're just like, yeah, it's kind of, okay. That's good to know. Uh, I, I really expected this to mean physical, like sort of physical separation. Like when I put stuff inside of this class, it means that it's only in this class, but that's not correct. That's use very useful information. I like JavaScript already less. Uh, okay. Yeah. So the interesting thing, I guess, is that this is the piece that's being sent um, in, or actually both of these things are being sent, the max and the val, um, so that it can be, well, I guess all of it is. Ultimately, this is JavaScript, right? Just like a slightly more principled way to write it. Is that the way to think about it? I don't even know. <sighs> I don't know anything. Okay, so it says naming this property val instead of value is no accident. Elm supply applies special handling to the value property. So it's best not to choose that particular name for custom properties. Yeah, it's like just kind of a principled way to do it. It's no, it's there's a lot less flexibility. Uh okay. So we've now I, I'm not sure that these sliders even look very nice. I, I don't really like the way they look. I'm not going to lie. I, I don't think that they should look this way. I don't think any human being would want them to look that way. But, okay. I should get off my high horse as if I'm a designer. All right, so now we're going to deal with custom events. We take a quick glance at JS range we can see that the slider emits a custom event called update. No, <laughs> we're not doing a CSS stream, Jappy. Not anytime soon, anyway. At some point, we will need to do uh, a CSS stream, but it will be inside. Um, as often as possible, I'm going to work inside Elm. Like, I'm go trying not to leave Elm um, as much as possible. We'll use the, what's it called? Elm, Elm UI or whatever to to do css and stuff as well we'll try we'll see if i can do it okay so the slider emits a custom event called update from its range object as the slider slides hmm. yeah the cascading part is always the part that confuses me so this event reports the current slider's value, so we'd like to listen for it and update our model with that value. Our Elm code can't listen to events emitted by the JavaScript range object itself, but it can listen to events from the range slider custom element. We can add a bit, a quick bit of JavaScript code uh, to listen for the range object's update event and broadcast its value from the range slider so that we can hear it over in Elm land. Let's add this to our uh, to the end of our connected callback method. Okay, so what we're going to do is apparently inside of our JavaScript, uh, we're now, now that we have this, uh, what is it called? JavaScript range object. That's what JSR stands for, by the way. Um, we're going to generate a uh, an event so that on the Elm side, we can listen to it. So var range slider node equals this. Why do I need that? Can I just use this? Do I need to do that? Why do I need to do that? This seems like a waste. I can't imagine that this makes a copy. Does this make a copy? I don't know. I'm pretending like I know stuff. Add event listener. 
update. Yeah, that's okay. As long as it really does nothing, because like, I can't imagine that it does something. I'm thinking of JavaScript like I think of Python, so that's probably mostly accurate in the semantics, right? Like the way things I expect to behave. Probably not always true, but... Detail. Users slid even compared to Python? Wow, that's actually kind of surprising to me. Okay, so yeah. So uh, did I tell you about the um my analogy for Python? I don't know if you've heard it yet. I came up with an analogy that I kind of like for comparing Python to Haskell for people who have never programmed before. Um, okay, so the idea is basically with Python, you're basically assembling a puzzle where all the pieces are square. Right? You could basically fit anything together that you want, but you know, you're not possible you're not guaranteed to have the, the right shape when you're done. Right? Whereas with Haskell, you get to make the pieces the shapes that you want to make them, and you can ensure that they all fit together in the right way. That's that was the analogy I came up with recently and I kinda liked it. I thought it was a decent analogy anyway. This has got to go back over here, I guess. Yeah, it, I think that it, it just kind of, it fits nicely. Oh, right, right. This is this one. This is this one. I need a formatter right now. Yeah, I think it's like a, an, an easy way to explain what the difference is between something like, the, you know, Haskell, Elm, etc., or really a strongly typed language that guides you via the type system. Oh no, um, versus something like JavaScript and, and Python. Ugh. Did I say that backwards? I don't even know. I'm I'm very tired and sick. Okay, dispatch. I'm not that worried about it. We're hopefully going to be done with this very soon. Event. No, this has got to go inside. That doesn't make any sense. We could put this in another file if we wanted to. Okay. So we're going to listen for update events and then we're going to fire off a custom event. Uh with some detail, whatever that means, user slid to and some value. So I guess this is how we get back messages from from JavaScript by firing off these custom events. Okay. Now uh, whenever the user drags the slider around, our range slider element will emit a slide event with the new value. Internet Explorer, I don't care about Internet Explorer. Apparently there's a different way to deal with uh, custom events. It doesn't say that it does, it just gets an event. I can show you what the book says. Can you read that? Event. Where? What function part?
first line. First line of mine? Oh, I see it now. What's up, Warren? How are you? So, LM value. There, right? That's what you mean? Nice. Wonderful. Actually, I think you told me that before. I, I can't remember where. Um, if you don't, if you don't mind uh, answering, where are you uh, visiting? The U.S. is kind of a big place. <laughs> oh, right, right. You did tell me Dayton, and and you were going to be. Uh, yeah, you did tell me that. Sorry, situational memory, kind of a problem. Okay, thanks for catching that, by the way, because it probably is going to yield some strange error or do nothing, and then I'll be like, what the hell? There's a lot of syntax here. My goodness. Okay. So now... Okay, so it says, now, now that we're dispatching the slide event, how might we respond to it in Elm? So the H, it says the HTML attributes has a variety of built-in event handlers such as on click, but there's no on slide. So the HTML attributes has no idea that it exists. So I think we need to build that. So it says HTML events on function lets us create a custom event handler, handler similarly to how HTML node uh, function lets us create a custom element and the HTML properties function lets us create a custom property. So this is going to give us a JavaScript. Well, let's do it this way. They might show us a, an easier way to do it. I don't even, I, I mean, again, I don't know what I'm doing, so. You you have much more familiarity with this stuff than I do, so on change doesn't really mean much. Well, I guess it does. With on, with on change, do we know what the value would be? What's going on, Lumi? Do we know what the value? I guess we do because it's stored inside of the component, right? But I don't know how to extract that in Elm. Anyway, there's probably other ways to do this. Um, how was everybody's holiday, by the way? Did everybody have a good new year? I think Jappy drank a little too much, if I recall correctly. <laughs> um, okay. We need to create a decoder for the, the JavaScript that's emitted there. <laughs> we've all been there <laughs> so our <laughs> our event is going to look something like this user slid to you know n probably shouldn't use curly braces but int something like this for sure So we need to create a decoder for this, is my guess. All right, so let's look at our other decoder. I suppose we could use this succeed function again.
No, let's not do that. Let's just. So we're going to say. Uh, okay. Um, what, let's see here. So we need to create a decoder. So it's going to be like. Um, Something like this field. No, no, the decoder is is just this. It doesn't take any input. Field detail. Right, so we need to call it decode. <sighs> what did I just do? Okay, so in theory, that's all you need to de do to decode this. I really wish these stuck. Why? Whatever. Okay, there's a convenience function in JSON decode for the case where we want to call field on another field. Uh, we can use at. Okay, so we can write, instead of this, we can write decode at and then nest our fields like so. And we're going to expect an int there, something like this. That's a pretty convenient function. Um, okay, so it says this decoder will decode an integer from the JavaScript object such as the, the one I showed you here. But is that what we want? Let's look at the type of on again. Which on is, is it talking about? What on? I have no idea what it's talking about. What on function are we talking about here? Uh, uh, I feel like I missed something. Oh, okay, okay, let me read this again. So the on function allows, lets us create a custom event handler. So the custom event handler has type string to decoder message to attribute message. So what we really want to do is create a message, not uh, the, we're going to need the decoder, but we need to like deal with our, We need to deal with the, the message by converting this integer into a message that our application understands. So we're going to get like, um, like a slider change message, and we need to map that probably.
Okay, so here we probably only, according to this, we probably only need uh, on, on to create our custom handler. And then we're going to say, on is going to take an int Here, let me bring this up to the top. Detail user slid to decoder int. Oh, this is just the implementation. I see. So we're just moving this inside this function. Which is fine. Like, we don't need it anywhere else. So. I think I called this just decode. So decode map to message detail user slid to. In on slide. So this is just going to be our function that converts our integer to the message we need. And then we'll take on slide. Later, Jappy. Nice to see you. What is this complaining about? No, I exposed this explicitly so we can leave that like that. Something is off. I think I just wrote something wrong. I did. This should be that. And then there you go. So what I had here was obviously wrong. It's the two message from here, which is a value, not a type. So it has a type, but it's not a type. So you can't write that. Excuse me. OK, does this uh, make sense so far? I think we're, we're going to basically call on slide uh, and this will give us an attribute message, which is interesting. Oh, that's our, this is our, um, this is like on click. That's the idea. But then it says, you notice how on slide takes int to message? This is because we need it to be flexible. We plan uh, to have multiple sliders on the page, and we'll want to each of them to have a unique message variant so that we can tell each message apart. Uh, the two message lets us pass in an appropriate variant on a case-by-case -case basis, which will come handy later. Uh, refactoring using pipelines. So...
we could write this slightly differently and do the following. So we want to make our decode and then we want to decode map to message onto the result of that. And then we want to uh, on slide to the result of that, right? So we have this huge let in thing. And I was like, that looks ugly to begin with. So uh, you can avoid a lot of that by just doing the following. Oh, why, why did it bring me all the way up there? I tried to format the code and it brought me to the top of the page. Okay. So anyway, this is much cleaner, but sometimes it's hard to see this stuff right away, especially if you're not used to it. So um, it's just a cleaner way to write this. So remember, this is just pass the result of this to this function. Pass the result of these two things to this function. That's all that's doing. Okay. Now we can add our on slide message, but we also need to change this a little bit. So we need an int to message function and a string, an int, and that. So here is our to message function that we're going to pass to on slide. And then down here, we're going to have on slide to message. Okay, um, and our view filter function will now be broken because we're not passing it an on slide function. So we'll deal with that here in a second, probably. So it says we have three filters, each of which has a name and a magnitude. How should we check the current values in our model? Let's walk through walk through two approaches. So let's put to get this thing to compile that can't possibly work, right? Yeah, no, that's not going to work. Um, well, anyway, this is broken. We'll deal with it in a second. So we get a few options for uh, storing these values for hue, ripple, and noise in our model. We could just have a records store the filters as a list of records. Yeah, I'm just going to bring this. I'm just going to show this on screen because it's going to be a little harder to deal with. So we could do this where hue, ripple, and noise are separate integers, or we could have a list of records. And this is what the, the, this would look like. Either we start here like hue, hue equals files, noise equals five, or a list of records like that. Okay, before we continue, I need to use the bathroom because I've been drinking a ton of tea today and a ton of water. So usually I try to take the break around 9.30, but we're, you know, it is what it is. Interesting. I didn't notice this before. It puts the error message up here. That's awesome. I didn't notice that before. So this is Elm Live, by the way, if I didn't mention that before. Anyway, I'll be right back. Give me just a few seconds to use the bathroom. Uh, be right back.
All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, oh, boy. I almost hit the wrong button. I almost just hit stop streaming. That would have been a good one. All right. So, um, my... So before I keep reading, my personal preference is going... Oh, I should show this here. My personal preference would be to just put Hugh Ripple and Noise as their own... Uh, their own entries here because not... Like, if I do this, I have to go find the Hue, the Ripple, and the Noise every time. Like, there's going to be a ton of filtering. Um, but we'll see what it says or what they think. So it says... Each model has its own strengths and weaknesses. Um, I'm just going to show this on stream. It's going to be a lot easier. So it's like our updating model will be, you know, slid hue, slid ripple, slid noise, or slid filter. Um, I'm pretty preferential to this at this point. Yep. This is exactly what I was thinking. We're going to have something like this, which I don't like. Um, Yeah, I mean, this is clearly very helpful. I don't know. I don't love the list of records idea. Why can't it be a map? Do we have a map in here? I don't know. Okay. I guess we're going to do that. I don't love it, but it is what it is. So... We're going to have some filters. Which is going to be a list of records that contain a name. And an amount. Isn't there a map? Why, like, why is this hard? I, I feel like there should be. Um, Elm documentation. I would much prefer it to be package docs. Core? The dict. Let's use a dictionary because a dictionary. Yeah, it's just not called map. So, like, for me. I feel like I would rather have a dictionary because I can look up things by value or by, like by the name of the filter or something. And later, if we, you know, our filter could represent something different than a string if we wanted it to. I feel like this is going to be better because I assume that there's like a keys yeah so we can get a list of the keys if we need them we can get a list of the values if we need them uh, things like this so I think I would prefer having a dictionary over a list of records be just because we have the ability to index them by value instead of using that funky if so and also this gives me a way to like just play with this code a little bit more instead of like implementing exactly what's in the book I'm implementing something slightly different so let's do this so it's going to be a dict from string to int there's no integer and we can import dict 
exposing. That's an interesting idea too. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Um, a hue, a ripple, and a noise. Thank you for that, by the way, because that's a very obvious. A very obvious improvement from a string. Because we can pattern match on it, um, it's you know a lot more obvious to deal with. And yeah, I like that a lot better. OK, so from here, um, we're going to have some issues probably. Um, we'll just expose the entirety of dictionary and see what happens. Yep. So this is fine because we know that's going to fail. So we'll fix that here in a second. Uh, what we need to do is deal with our initial model. So our initial model is going to be basically a from list. And here we'll just have our list of stuff. So we're going to have hue. Oh, this has got to be a top ball. U five. Ripple five. And what's the other one? Noise. Noise five. And it's going to be equals Oh, interesting. Those have to be comparable. How do I make something comparable? I probably can't make something comparable, can I? Uh... How do I do this then? So it looks like I can't. Or unless there's an actual enum type. Elm.
Okay, uh, so that apparently doesn't exist, and our keys are not are not comparable if we use a custom type. So. As far as I understand, there's no way to make these like comparable. So there's nothing we can really do here. Um, Yeah, I don't think you can do this, right? Yeah, so they're just using filters. We could create this function. Yeah, I mean, that would work, right? Versus, also, hey, I, I don't think I've seen you before, so thanks for, for commenting. Um, yeah, I mean, like, we could do something like this where we create a function that just keeps the, keeps track of them for us, and then we just use, you know, this uh, day to int function or int to day function and just use that where we need it. Um but we could just do, we could just use a, something like this one, where we do like, if filter equals name, um, but instead of transform filter, we'll just pattern match, right? On the different types and, you know, uh, just map over them or something. Let's do it that way, I guess. But you're right, there's there's really not an easy way to deal with this, so. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll keep our idea of, oh, okay, where, where is that? Yeah, it is annoying. I see how, like, this would annoy me immediately. What's up, Pretz? How's it going? Um, okay, so, anyway. It's fine. Let's just do it. Let's just do it um, with standard. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So type just allows you to define custom some types, and then there's there's type aliases like this one, which basically just define this record type as the name model. That's all. Yep. So this is just an alias for this type. Basically, this is an actual sum type. So I think what we're going to do is just use a list of uh, like a, a list of these. But do we want to just use pairs? Probably not.
I mean, we can't do that, right? I guess we can. Uh, no, it's not four records. Like, you could write... Um, we could write the following type alias um, integer equals int for example it doesn't have to be a record you can just use it to represent a record but this is perfectly acceptable as well but yeah this is for ADTs yep exactly versus so this is like one thing where Haskell helps us a lot because we could just implement the interface comparable and we're done Right? Like we wouldn't have to worry about this at all in Haskell. If it's not clear, by the way, I do a lot of Haskell on, on Tuesdays right now. We've, we've switched Thursdays into Elm World. It's been going good so far. Actually, I, I like writing Elm. It's kind of fun. Um, yeah, probably. I, I don't know what the reason is offhand, obviously, but I presume that there's a reason. Oh, no, we want to leave that there. And then we'll just do... That is a keyword, so we probably can't use that. Um, I just feel like filter. We could use name, I guess. Okay, and then we got to fix this because we're no longer an addictive filter. We're a list of name. Filter. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, we, we want to avoid complexity. Like for someone like us, it, it, you know, Elm is sort of limiting, which I guess is probably why PureScript exists, right? Um, name value. Because I assume in in pure script, if you had a dictionary and it had some comparable thing, you would just deal with it, right? Like it wouldn't be a problem. Similar to how Haskell isn't a problem, right? So does this make sense? That between the aliases, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. So like we could write, um, you know a type alias for this record if we wanted to, and then we could just say list of these things. Yeah, they're, they're choosing simplicity on purpose. And that's totally fine, except when you... Uh, except when you, you really wish you didn't have them. But it sounds like what, what Lumi said is really um, interesting I didn't know about. Is like there are there's a library where the keys don't have to be comparable. You know what? screw this let's use the right thing for the job let's see if we can find that elm all dict yeah so i think we're looking for this So what's the difference between an all dict and an every dict? I think we want an every dict. Yeah, this looks like what we want. Okay. So what we need to do... Uh, this is pop os um it's fine um i used it only because i was lazy like i've gotten lazier as i've gotten older like i've installed arch linux probably 20 times at least um and so 
Like I was, just, I've just gotten to the point where I'm, I'm feeling particularly lazy these days. It's probably not a very good um, excuse. So I suppose we do Elm install. Well, okay. All, what is it? Elm all dict like this. At two point oh point one, something like this. Okay, so I suppose this isn't compatible with. Does this imply that it's? Yeah, so um, pick for me, I've used just pretty much Arch Linux and um, different versions of Ubuntu. But you know, for me, like a distro, it, it, like this machine is just to get stuff done. Like I don't care that much. But people talk a lot about doing Nix, so it's definitely something to think about at some point. Now, one thing I don't understand is why I can't install this thing. It seems like it's probably not the right one. Yeah. So we, we actually did at one point a, um, a stream with Jappy Jappy, if you're familiar with, with him, um, on getting started with Nix, but I, I haven't really spent a lot of time with it. Okay, so th this is probably what we want. Maybe I just had the wrong one. So jjant elm dict. Yeah, it's just like setting up Arch. I was too lazy to do it, right? That's That was it. Um, I, I don't plan on doing like Nix OS, but I might use Nix for dealing with the software. jjant elm dict yep okay so this one works yeah so uh pick i i i play with uh, well let's say it this way when when i first started grad school i was put in front of an arch Linux computer and I just like didn't have enough time to do anything else. So I kind of just learned Arch. And then I got to the point where I was like, okay, well, now I need to install Arch Linux on every Like I was managing all the computers in the lab. So I was doing a ton of system admin and he, the, my advisor didn't want to switch. So it was like, you're going to learn to install it. And I didn't really have a choice. So like, you know, if you really wanted to learn how to do it just once, boot up a VM, try to install it. It's not that hard. Um, they give you installation instructions and stuff. I don't know. Um, you can basically get access to every package through the Arch Linux user repository. Uh, user repository. So like, yeah, so this, you can pretty much find any piece of software on the internet um, through Arch Linux user repository. It's not always up to date, but you can fix that. And uh, like Lumi said, it's a rolling distro. So um, you get all the latest security releases and stuff. And I would say that like five years ago, six years ago or more, I don't even remember when I started, when I was using Arch Linux, like that idea of rolling was kind of problematic because they were making a lot of changes that would break your computer. Um, but recently the, the Arch Linux rolling releases have not been all that um, unstable so I think if you were like to get in now is really a good time to get into to Arch Linux yes yeah yeah I, I use stack but um, like the default version you need to update so anyway what was I doing oh right we were installing Elmdict from jjant 
So thank you, Jjant. So now we have this thing here, and in theory we should be able to use our new our new dictionary. But how do we use it? We need all dict. I don't really like the name, but that's probably fine. So, so we need this, and we need probably that. Okay, so we're going to have a dictionary from filter to int. And then down here, we can use from list um i messed up oh well what do these need to be in tuple yes What I should have done is used a macro to do this, and I didn't. So now I'm going to pay the price by spending all too much time writing. But it's too late. I've moved on with my life. OK. So now this. All right. Oh, there you go. So now we just get these hues and some errors there, and that's perfect. OK, cool. So we just need to go fix this. So by the way, if you are wondering, it's the same data structure as dict in core, a red black tree, but it's just not restricted to comparable stuff, I guess. It's interesting to me that that was a design decision, that those things should be comparable. But maybe that's another JavaScript thing that I'm just not familiar with. OK. So anyway, now we got the data type that I want. Um, for reference, we've been talking about this for so long just because it's just an Elm insanity thing. Uh, there are not type classes in Elm, yeah, unfortunately. But again, uh, we were talking about this earlier. I'm not sure when you hopped in, but um, we think that that was a uh, well. Somebody said it. I can't remember if it was Pretz or Versus, but they said that basically that was a design decision by Elm because they they wanted it to be as simple as they wanted to be simple uh, for you know people coming from JavaScript. Okay. So now we have this dictionary. Nice. Let me scroll down. So what's the next thing we need to fix? Uh, is Elm closer to OCaml than Haskell? I've never written any OCaml, so I don't know. But I know that this operator to a lot of people looks OCaml-y. Um, this operator, like these pipes, look very um ocamily to people but i would say that this looks a lot like haskell the only thing that's flipped is basically this and you know you get some extra functions but yeah that could be too loomy i'm not i'm i don't know their um not flip dot it's actually its own function in um, in Haskell. It's this function, All right? We take an A and an A to B, so it's it's actually this function because dot is A to B, B to C the other way. Sorry, B to C, A to B. Yeah, flip dollar sign. You got it. You got it. Um, 
Although I don't know if the same semantics are involved here with dollar sign, right? Um, I assume they are. As in A has to be fully evaluated, right? Like everything past the dollar sign or in front of the dollar sign has to be evaluated before we move on. I'm not sure if the semantics are the same. I guess I need to mess with that um, to find out for sure. I'm not... I've actually never used it. We should use it more. Mm. Yeah, it's kind of like composed, but it's more like dollar sign. Yeah, and and yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the 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 reason ML was written by um that guy who is starting to get pretty prominent in the Haskell community, right? The Flavio, is that his name? Maybe not completely developed by that guy, but he seems to work on it or But I think he's trying to switch to Haskell. Unless I, he's just like prominent in the ReasonML community. I'm not really sure. Okay, what's the next failure? It could be. Um, I could be thinking about the wrong thing and just... No, I'm probably wrong. Uh, let's be honest. <laughs> um, this is probably not the best way to go find... The people who create this. This guy. Yeah, okay. Not the same person that I was thinking. Let's see if that person's even here. And maybe I was just, I had the wrong thing on, uh, in my brain. Yeah, I think I just had the wrong thing on my in my brain, so ignore me. I I I don't know a lot of things. I try. I try my best. Okay. So I lost my train of thought. Where are we where are we going with this? Okay. So we need to create some messages. Hugh. That's exactly correct. Excuse me. So we're going to create a message called um, got slid filter. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's like removing that, that thing from, from Haskell. The fact that you can do everything a million ways. So what are we going to get from slid filter? We're going to get a filter and an integer, I guess. No, we're not. We're just going to get, yeah, we are. Well, we're going to get a string and an integer, I think. Well, we'll see what this ends up looking like. It's sort of a cool thing and a less cool, like it's it's cool and not cool at the same same time. Okay, so down here we're gonna get a got slid filter. It's going to have a name and an amount. And then what we need to do is update Where is this?
Oh, right. I want this to compile, so I need to do... That's like the pass-through function in this case. Um, what I want to do is see where that thing is being interpreted. I wrote a function for this. Unfortunately, this is getting unruly. It's a little long. It's right here. Right, we're going to pass this a to message function. So we can make the to message function whatever we want. So our to message function is going to be able to deal with um, the types. So we can just take whatever the integer is and its name and convert that into the types that we want. So our message can actually, it doesn't have to be a string, it can actually be a, a filter and an int. That's really what we want. Right, and then we're just going to update the dictionary with its value, essentially. And we can actually write that. We don't need to, we don't need to like fix the whole thing to figure that out. So we're going to say uh, filters equals, and then we need to basically update the, the piece he here. If you guys have any questions, by the way, about the syntax and stuff, like don't hesitate to ask me. Um, like this is a record update syntax, for example, if you've not seen that. It seems like a lot of folks are familiar with Haskell, so um, this is different than Haskell. This is just a regular old tuple. Uh, this is our message. So basically this means that when it gets here, as long as I do nothing else on the web page, it's done. Like it's going to stay static. Um, if I have something else on the right side, like here, it's not super obvious that there's something on the right side, but there is. Um, this is basically generating uh, another step. So when you click this, something, another message will be triggered and it will go to got random photo in this case. So it, it's not obvious, but that's where it's gonna go. And then you'll see we get command none, so it stops. So like every time you get an update message, you can create a new update message, um, but you don't have to. So that's how you, that's how you end the, the loop or whatever. Are you updating filters with the same filters from the module? Uh, what module? I, I, I'm not sure. Oh, are you updating filters? Yes, right now I am, but I'm going to fix that in a second. Uh, what I need to do is go look at the dictionary implementation to see how to modify it. That's all I'm doing. Sorry if that wasn't clear. Uh, I just wanted to come here to see how I update. So. I don't want to insert, I want to update. Okay, so this overwrites any key already set, so we can just use uh, insert. And that's gonna come from here. We should put this on the bottom. I don't really like it on the top. Oh, uh, sorry, Pret says, is Elm pure? Does it have IO separation or something? Uh, there is no IO separation, but it is pure. Um, you model effects by using this update function, basically. So you're, whenever, you, you would, you, whenever you do an update, you return a new model. So it's like you're given a model and you return a model. That, that's always the case. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's fix this. So we're just going to say insert our key, which is our filter, our amount into model.filters, 
And as far as I understand, this returns a new dictionary. And so we're good. So again, every time we're building a new model, right? That's the idea. So it's pure in that sense. I think there's, it's more complicated than that. As in the actual implementation is probably only changing our filters. It's not, it's not doing that, but you should think of it like the function is returning a completely new model. So in that sense, it's pure. Okay, so I think this is this is actually the right implementation for got slid filter. We still need to deal with our view filter function. Which we haven't I haven't even gotten to yet. Yep, and this is going to be a little different. So what we want to do sorry we want to write list dot map but we can't do this Yes. Well, the the thing behind the it's not the model itself, it's it's the loop behind the scenes. So let me see if I can find a picture of like an example of the loop running behind the scenes real quick from the book. Here we go. So like there's this Elm runtime and that behaves like real world, the state real world. And essentially, you're you you have these messages that are going in and out. Um, so sort of everything's happening in I/O, right? Um, so everything is modeling a side effect, I suppose. Uh, I'm kind of thinking about this out loud. Um, I've not really thought about this before, but I think you could basically imagine everything happening in I/O, um, and I guess yeah everything happening in IO and returning pure values every time, right? I think that makes sense. But so something like this is, is how this is dealt with. Am I saying that right? Lumi might be able to correct me, but I think I'm pretty close if I'm not saying it correctly. Okay, well. <laughs> me neither i don't know what i'm doing I, I don't i don't have any clue what i'm doing i just do my best uh we're almost where i need to be in the book sorry i should have paid attention to what page number i was on and i did not so i'm Yeah, you don't really have to. Um, I think that's kind of the nice thing. It's like the only thing you really need to think about is, um, you know, come back. Oops, hang on. We got to deal with this next. Um, like you have some init function. Yeah, yep. You have this init function, this update function, and a view function. And essentially there's just... Yeah, things happening that are being re and you're just responding to them. That's that's all it is. So maybe more like FRP, but I've never done FRP either. So my understanding of FRP is there's a time component. So like you know when these things are triggered, but here you don't know when they're triggered as far as I understand. That that could not it be entirely true but you can model things over time in frp and i don't think you can do that with elm not in the same way anyway don't quote me on that that's probably wrong 
but I think your functions have time components in FRP. I wish Jappy was here. Jappy did leave, unfortunately. Um, all right, what am I doing? We need to go figure out how to deal with this dot 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 that I just wrote in there. Oh yeah, that's not gonna work. Okay, so one problem with the the situation that we have is our map function is we need to create a list. So we have this dictionary now instead of a list. Let me show you wherever I put it. So we're using a dictionary with these keys and these values, right? But as far as I can see, there's no way to pull those back out. So like you, you have from list, but you don't have to list. And I'm not sure exactly why. There's also no keys function. This is a very unfortunate. I just want a keys function. Yeah, there is a git function, but like I need I need to know the keys or something so that I can I, I need a list back basically. So this is a little frustrating. Yeah. Wrong one. Oh, that's a good point. It's sort of a one way operation. Hmm. This is unfortunate. Well, maybe we should just go back to trying not to be cool. Oh, which one were you looking at? Which one do you have, Lumi? I know what dependent types are, Pretz, but I've never written anything with... Well, actually, that's not true. We implemented dependent types in Haskell at one point. Um, it should be in one of my YouTube videos. Um... It's thinking with types. So I think that here is my YouTube list. And you might be able to find, um, if you look here, there's the thinking with types list. And I think the last chapter, 15, is the one with dependent types. So you could see how I did dependent types by watching those videos if you wanted to. It's kind of a roundabout way to get to YouTube, but um, I also have YouTube. Nope, it's YouTube. There you go. There you go. So, uh, Idris. Yeah, I'd like to look at dependent types at some point because I think they'd be cool. Um, Lumi, that one you sent me, I looked at that one, but it doesn't have, it doesn't work with L19. So I can't use it. I tried to, yeah, that's okay. I tried to install this one and it doesn't work.
I would like to use this one, but it doesn't work. So unfortunately, I think we need to go back to um, the imp implementation we didn't want, but that's okay, I guess. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to make a list of Well, uh, maybe we could try it. Probably not. Um, I mean, let's just go look at the source code. That's all right, Lumi. Yeah, I don't think this is going to work. Unfortunately. Maybe it can, but I really don't know. Let's see if it compiles. Versus, hang on. Jeez. So I have it. Eventually we'll do that one. Probably. Um, we'll see. I I'm kind of like a... I like buying books, so... Truthfully, I think this two list might work, by the way. Uh, okay, Pretz said something too I missed. Um, in CoQ... It's... Do you say Coke? I think it's Coke. Uh, and maybe Idris is possible to inspect the definition of a function if you are proving its properties, like extract keys. Okay. So let's try the to list function on the makeshift dictionary. So first things first, we need to write to list. Wait, what went here? Oh, right. This is going to have to be here. Um, we're going to have view, um, filter, and then in here we're going to have to list and We're going to have to deal with this as well. There's a lot going on here. You know, we've been sort of implementing things, but it actually uh, at the end starts talking about how you pick one of these implementations. Okay. So let me read a little bit. Um, I'll just put it up on the screen. I gotta sneeze first. All right, we got three. We'll see. I don't think there's gonna be another one, but maybe there will be. Okay. Um, yeah, writing ripple instead of ripple causes an issue. We've already sort of talked about this, which is why we moved to the, the ADT. If we use slid ripple, we'll get a compiler error. <coughs> and the compiler error will probably be very helpful. 
What about making changes? Uh, if we want to rename Ripple to Swirl. I have a feeling that they're going to just tell us to use the three inch, inch approach. By using individual fields instead of a list of records, we can rule out the entire category of bugs related to invalid filter names. So they actually go back to um, Okay, fine. We'll go back to that. I actually prefer that. And the other cool thing is we can do something like the following. Um, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to go back to that. Well, now we want specific types for each of these, right? So this is one of those things that I like to do in Haskell is um, try to create aliases for these whenever possible to help my type imprints. Uh, although I think I can just put hue here, right? Or do I have to put filter there? I don't remember. I think I have to put filter there. Yeah, that's what I thought. So. So what we're going to do is just wrap these. And Again, this is one of those things that I'm, I don't care that it's more boilerplate because the compiler will help me make sure that I don't screw this up in various places because I'm going to screw it up. So I much prefer to have the compiler tell me when I screwed up instead of deal with it later, right? So here we have um, the type we're actually going to use. Um, where we just store hue, ripple, and noise as actual constructors that contain those things. So this is probably what I would do in Haskell, is just create a new type for each of these things. And so we'll, we'll do the same thing in Elm and try and... Um, try and be good about it. I don't know. I imagine some people will think this is overkill, but I sort of like this now. Okay, now, why is this not compiling? Something's broken. What's broken, though? Oh, I probably am, like, I probably don't have an incomplete piece of code here. Um, we'll get back to that in a second. Okay, so up here, we can get rid of that. We can get rid of this. Okay, what next? Okay. 
now we got to do with this one. So, um, this goes back to what it was before. Basically, uh, you filter. Oh, right. We need to update our messages. So got slid. Let's call it slid. Got a little ripple. And then view filter slid noise noise. And this noise, by the way, is just for um, a title. So we could probably move that inside the view filter if we wanted to, because we now know uh, what kind of um, messages we're getting. So we can just deal with that. Okay. So our view filter, I don't think needs to change. We need to update our message. So it's not going to be this anymore. It's just going to be got slid you Why do I keep wanting to write that R? Got slid noise, I think. Okay, what next? What is this complaining about? I've not written hue anywhere. Okay, hang on. So we no longer need this thumbnail size because it's included in our model. I think it's model size. Got slid noise, not slide noise. Okay, what's the next error? Did I? Jobs. Where is this code? 173. I disagree with you. That code doesn't exist. I think it's broken. 
Okay, that's better. Maybe I should have come in here to see this. I should have checked if it had the right thing. Oh well. We don't need any of those anymore. Okay, so we need to deal with each of those events separately. We need to look at our update function. And instead of got slid filter, we're going to say got slid. Is it? Um, hue. And we're just going to get an amount this time. And so, what do we need to do with our model? Just update the hue. Hue equals amount. Got slid. Ripple. Sorry, I don't know why I'm having such a hard time remembering the names of these things. I think I'm just tired. Ripple. Noise. Okay. So that'll allow us to fix that bug. Right. So I have to put them in front of the data constructor. Again, I don't know that this is completely necessary, um, but I'm, I'm erring on the side of caution because I don't, fully know well I guess we can write the following function to find out um hang on let's let's fix this so view filter Let's let's get this working first and then I'll I'll move back. Are we done? So So to deal with this we're oh wait right this is problematic the way I did it because now I can't just send it an integer Ugh we're removing that I don't want to though Maybe it doesn't matter. I think I'm being... If I want to finish today, let's do this. <laughs> I'm not going to finish today if I don't. I would like to finish Chapter 5 before 10.30. Oh, let's just do that. I think I'm going overkill anyway. What's the next error? Next error. So this succeeds, which is problematic because it probably, well, it didn't work.
Did anything work? It doesn't even change this. This dot dispatch event is not a function. Okay. So the good news is, is my error is not on this side. Ah, that's why I needed that. Uh, I didn't see this before. So this, this is not the right this. I need the JSR. So... I, or I'm sorry, I need this outer object. So what we, what they did here is they did um, var on third party side. Yeah, it's bad news. It, it's just because I wrote the code incorrectly. Um, so I misunderstood the point of what they did earlier. So you know that's that's why. So if I write range slider equals this then down here i can do a range slider dot dispatch event that was the problem so now if i restart this and we look at this in theory i should start yeah see we go from 0 to 11 and that works so i had the wrong dispatch event thing so uh, prutz 